I guess it would be on the the left side. Oh, here's one. Good. Yeah. And then uh, more of a kind of golden womb ish yeah. egg. A little bit fetal there. That was the backside of the previous doodle that had bled through that I allowed to incorporate in this. Um, I got cheap sketchbooks for this on purpose so that they would bleed through and you'd kind of get an artifactual image. Uh -huh. So you basically get a lot of little toes, uh, uh -huh. little feet, um, <laughs> and uh, inner gold kind of kind of feel. You call it doodle. Is that really like doodling? You're, you're... Yeah, like doodling, and it's also mark of the self. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah. We we've had a number of uh, sessions with Co Colleen Kiber on uh, this topic, okay. uh, so you should, uh, Vanessa, go back okay. on the YouTube channel and look at a couple of those sessions to get an idea of what we're right. doing. But I'll do that. We're trying to understand what's going on in the collective unconscious. And, um, ah, oh, well, I'm glad to see you. David G is coming and- um, Morning, Juan. You are? Yeah. And David? And so good morning. Um, so Skip, I also got it on the, the coffee cup. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so this is your doodle from last time, is that right? Yeah, the 2021. Oh, okay. I had it made into a 24 bar 36 poster. <laughs> okay so i all can't right. stop looking at it and i have to remember <laughs> okay let me see gotta get this to a position uh good morning nick chan welcome uh and uh so our nick is here from singapore and uh so um I want to talk uh, to begin at the beginning here about rules um, because uh, there's been a tremendous, uh, and this relates to the religious stuff too, because obviously there are lots of rules in religion. <laughs> and, um, and as we probably all know, um, it, Jordan Peterson has been well known for his rules of life, 12 rules for life. And, um, and various people have the idea that uh, Jordan Peterson is a Jungian, which is not the case at all because um, he does, first of all, he hasn't gone to any of the Jung Institutes, and so he's not a Jungian analyst at all. Um, but he is a Jung name dropper because he's uh, managed to find a lot of dreams, or I'm sorry, memes, not dreams, memes, bad dreams uh, out there that he likes. And so he says, oh, I got this from Jung. Okay, so anyway, he's cherry picking, um, but uh, he's not a Jungian. And uh, that is most clearly stated by what I'm about to read to you. Uh, but rem remembering that uh, he had this best-selling book called 12 Rules for Life. And uh, then he had, now he's coming out with a new book in March called uh, 12 more rules. And uh, this is going to relate, I'm going to relate this to the French Revolution, David, so you'll enjoy this. <laughs> I hope you'll enjoy this anyway. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have here um, the Symbolic Life volume 18 of the collected works of C.G. Jung. So this is hidden back in in the deep depths of Jungian psychology, and um, you you won't know that this came from Dr. Jung unless you have really put in the time, and um, it's quite eye opening. So uh, the rules of life. Um, so just so you know, uh, there was a magazine called Welt Weltwatch. World Watch, I guess, in Zurich in um, 1954, in the 50s. And Jung was one of several prominent persons asked to comment on the topic of 
rule of the rules of life. And so this is what he said. And this is in, uh, as I say, volume 18, paragraphs uh, 1428 to 1430. In reply to your kind inquiry about rules of life, I would like to remark that I've had so much to do with people that I have always endeavored to live by no rules as far as possible. No observance of rules requires, of course, far less effort. For usually, one makes a rule in order to repress the tendency in oneself not to follow it. Okay. Um, so just think about that. Pretty much all the rules that we have are, are forcing us to do something we don't want to do. <laughs> Okay, in psychology, above all, rules are valid only when they can be reversed. Uh, also, they are not without their dangers, since they consist of words, and our civilization is largely founded on a superstitious belief in words. One of the supreme religious assumptions is actually the word. Words can take the place of men and things. This has its advantages, but it is also a menace. One can then spare oneself the trouble of thinking for oneself or making any effort to one's own advantage or disadvantage and that of one's fellows. Um, I have, for instance, a tendency to make a principle of doing what I want to do or should do as soon as possible. This can, uh, this can be very unwise and even stupid. The same applies to practically all adages and rules of life. Take, for example, the saying, uh, where, whatever it be, act prudently and consider the end. But in this way, however praiseworthy the principle is, you can let a vitally important decision of the moment slip through your fingers. No rules can cope with the paradoxes of life. Moral law, like natural law, represents only one aspect of reality. It does not prevent one from following certain regular habits unconsciously, habits which one does not notice oneself, but can only discover by making careful inquiries among one's fellows. But people seldom enjoy having what they don't know about themselves pointed out to them by others, and so they prefer to lay down rules which are the exact opposite of what they are doing in reality. Okay, comments. Hey men, <laughs> hey women. Uh, okay, uh, so that's- Dr. I especially like the part of um, laying down the rule to basically sequester something so that you don't do it. I... Yeah. Um, and I like the rule about, uh, about however praiseworthy this principle is, you can let a vitally important decision of the moment slip through your fingers. So when, um, when I met my current wife, uh, I was already married <laughs> and, and had been married for 17 years at that point. And, um, you know, if I hadn't made a, a decision that violated the so-called rules, um, I would still be married to another woman and maybe wouldn't be as happy as I am today. And uh, fortunately, I've managed to avoid the, the downside of, of uh, what can happen in a divorce by um, treating my ex-wife with reverse and making sure that my children um, know and knew that I still loved them and I still loved their mother, but I wasn't going to live with her anymore. Um, and uh, you know, the result of that, is, as Jordan noticed when he came aboard here, was that, uh, well, here, here's the result. I'll show everybody uh, my back screen here. And, uh, 
this is what I had on yesterday because uh, this <laughs> is uh, uh, yesterday we had a birthday party for my one-year-old daughter and um, granddaughter, right? Yeah. When, when, yeah, one year old granddaughter. And she, uh, in, in that call, were my ex wife, my ex wife's husband, uh, my ex sister in law, and her husband. Um, and, uh, and of course, all my in laws from uh, Ireland. So it was quite a good, <laughs> good event. And everybody, uh, Everybody still loves each other pretty much, uh, and uh, nice. And I wouldn't have developed to be the person I am without having married my current wife. So, uh, so it is a really wonderful story. And actually, that something came to mind about the young passages you wrote there. Bill Gates made a statement years back. He said, uh, "When when looking and approaching your most complex problems." Assemble a team of your laziest people. They have fewer rules and they'll get to the solution much faster so they can get back to doing nothing. Yeah. Now, um, I, I want to uh, put the on on David a little bit since David is from um, uh, Paris. And uh, are, you, are you French, David? Is your nationality French? Can't hear him. His screen froze. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think maybe there he David. is. Back. Sorry, I don't know. My computer is doing me. I went on my phone for a minute. Well, it seems yeah. to be working. Maybe I, I'll reboot in a minute. Okay. Uh, now I, I, I was saying I'm I'm a, I'm a Brit, uh, and I have an Italian mother, and I was uh -huh. born in France and raised partly in France. So I kind of consider myself, you know, like European. <laughs> so, okay, European. Okay. Not to mention the Jewish and Catholic. Uh... <laughs> All right. So uh, many Europeans are uh, kinds 57 varieties like Americans. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, probably a lot more of that is needed uh, in Europe. Um, but anyway, uh, I want to bring to your attention one of the uh, key historical events that Dr. Jung often uh, referred to. So I'm going to bring it up on the screen here. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the cult of reason. And uh, we have these, uh, what, what happened during the French Revolution is that um, a bunch of atheists got together and decided that they could live entirely by reason alone. And so among other things, they uh, created uh, the goddess of reason uh, who was um, brought into uh, Notre Dame. And here, here's the festival of reason in Notre Dame. They had taken a, a bunch of the furniture and piled it up in a big mountain. And uh, then, you know, apocryphal perhaps, but uh, the, um, a woman, a uh, fist of girls in white Roman dress and tricolor sashes milled around a, a costume goddess of reason who impersonated liberty. A uh, flame burned on the altar, which was symbolic of truth to avoid statuary and idolatry, the goddess figures were portrayed by living women. And in Paris, the role was played by uh, the wife of one of these gents who is said to have dressed provocatively. And according uh, to Thomas Carlyle, made one of the best goddesses of reason, though her teeth were a little defective. And so, um, I bring this to everyone's attention uh, because the French Revolution actually did not end well um, with uh, after after this happened. Uh, of course, the various cults on both sides fought back and forth, and 
decided it was a good idea to cut off the heads of their uh, opponents. And um, there was basically chaos until Napoleon came in and brought order to the, to the whole thing once again. Um, and so um, we have to be careful what we wish for in our American politics. Any thoughts? Napoleon is a product of the French Revolution now. I mean, militarily speaking, he, uh, he was a general in the, in the, he was reporting to the, to the, to the, to the French Revolution. I mean, before he made it the emperor, it's, and what, I, what I want to say is there's a continuum. Uh, yeah, it was a continuing problem for quite a while because he, he was, um, thrown off the throne, sent to um, St. Helena, I think. And uh, then he came back and tried to take over again. And um, then he led the, the French army into a campaign in Russia, which was a disaster. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I, I forget how Napoleon, oh, did, well, he lost at Waterloo, of course, but um, but uh, I don't know how he ended up dying ultimately. Stomach cancer. Ah, uh, yeah, they sent him to <laughs> Elba. Yeah. Saint Elba was the first one, and the, then uh, Elba, and then uh, Eleanor were. Okay. Said, yeah, yeah. They, then it, then they sent him to Saint Helena, which is out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and, <laughs> Where, where they didn't think he would come back again. And uh, so, yeah. And uh, so we, we have a Napoleon wannabe in the United States who uh, is going to have ruffles and flourishes and a 21 gun salute on um, his last day in office, which is, uh, you know, well, he it's got one, the hands. It's one, he pardon? got the hands right, but the rest of the body's a little too big. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's, um, uh, you know, what he failed to get in four years in office is that in order for those uh, ceremonies to be meaningful, you have to earn it. And, um, and so I'm sure his pea brain will think that that's wonderful on the day, but you know, the next day is going to be not president, <laughs> right? <laughs> no matter, no matter how many ruffles and flourishes they play for him. So, and uh, he does have a nice piece of history now. He's been impeached twice. So oh, yeah, the only president to ever do that. Oh yeah, he's uh, <laughs> very effective. Um, and of course we have uh, big problems in the US because uh, what he has shown is a psychic epidemic that exists in the United States. And this is one of the things that I'm, um, one of the reasons why I think we have to do better in educating about psychology in the United States, because, um, you know, all these news commentators about our events the last week, they, they are clueless about why these events are taking place, absolutely clueless. And, um, and anybody who has studied Jungian psychology understands clearly uh, that we've got a psychic epidemic going on here and that the president has fulminated that uh, psychic epidemic for five years now since before, you know, when he was running for office and maybe longer than that. And it was going on long before he really became prominent on the scenes. Uh, because we had the tea party before that and, um, and so on. So what we've now seen in its wonderful um, 
result is that our result so far, let's say, is that, you know, there are a lot of people that uh, have been contaminated in their mind in terms of what civilization is, what life is. Um, and, uh, you know, I just ask myself, you know, who really thinks that any of those people, if they were to take over the Congress, um, would make good government officials? <laughs> right. There's the, okay, so you, like, let's say you take it over. Now, what are you going to do with it? I mean, right. they're right. going to get caught with, you know, with it in their hand. And I think Frederick Douglass spoke to this when he said it's much easier to raise strong children than it is to repair broken men or to modernize a statement, broken people. Yeah. Um, Sure. And um, so, you know, we've got a lot of broken people in the United States and then, and they, they blame that they're blaming that on Democrats, but, and, you know, they've been calling us socialists for years and yet we're not the socialists. The socialists are the, <laughs> the, uh, the wealthy people who want to, uh, privatized profit, but uh, well, it's a new commodity. I mean, they're brokering and broken people. Yeah. And uh, so we have to educate uh, the American people better. And, uh, you know, one of those ways is to um, help people understand what religion does and did for them. And that's why I've been talking about uh, Jorge Ferrer, who Ferrer, I think David corrected me, <laughs> uh, who has written this book now, Participation in the Mystery. And uh, I'm working up to uh, the idea that, you know, reason isn't everything. Um, and, you know, Skip, there's a piece here too. America is pretty much the youngest company, youngest country on the block. I mean, under two, 250 years old, yeah. we're pretty much hitting the U.S. adolescence, as it were, relative to, I mean, you say 250 years old, someone in Paris would go, well, the house next to me is 500. I mean, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I remember well, being actually, behind the It's Pompidou. actually 400 years, though, because my ancestors we're in right Manhattan. but as a country i mean yeah. i mean so as a form uh, the formative aspects uh, i remember being behind the pompadour and walking down uh, the street and there was this building and my stepmother said well you see this house that's there it's it's very young it's 250 years old right next to it is 500 i mean it, it's <laughs> yeah. there's there are things and that it's not that they're maintained they're still healthy structures um, sure. that are standing so i mean there's a metaphor to me there architecturally and from an urban fabric standpoint even in paris you know or paris um it's that i think is useful to the american people because they don't understand it's almost like asked me when i was 19 because i knew everything then the u.s is kind of 19 right now yeah or a lot of it is not not in yeah, the, not all not in the city i live in because in, in the city i live in uh, is um, the the Maryland Inn, which was built in 1690, uh, right. and was the uh, building in which the Treaty of Paris, ending the American Revolution, was signed. Um, and yeah, even here, if I drive just north to Spring House, there's the you know the Spring House Tavern established. 1600 something 17 early 1700s and um it's obviously been remodeled but it it's been in that location since then yeah um so we do have have some old things here i mean we have the only um only state house in the country uh, annapolis is the capital of the state of maryland and we have the uh, the Capitol Dome here, which is the only wooden dome remaining in the United States. And on its peak, uh, there is a lightning rod that was put there by Ben Franklin, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and so we go way back. <laughs> right, right. Uh, um, and, and unlike Colonial Williamsburg, where you can go and you can experience 
the, the colonial experience, uh, that's really a theme park. They have a fence around it right. and they charge, uh, you know, tickets to go through colonial Williamsburg. But in our city, uh, we live in our colonial city in every way. And Well, and uh, what's interesting about, I mean, Maryland and Annapolis, um, there's, there's solid legacy there. And the thing is that legacy was, has been maintained and it worked out basically. It, it does yeah, its sure. P, it, the city does its PT, so to speak, in the morning. And so it stays healthy. Um, right. Whereas everywhere else, there kind of gets to be a growth by accretion and then just the sprawl of just letting things right. formlessly flow out into over the horizon, basically. Right. So uh, what I wanted to talk about, though, is uh, rational versus irrational or rational logos versus arrows a bit more. And so I, you know, I like to take a new book and open it randomly and also uh, open it to the end and figure out what the conclusions of the author are <laughs> before. You must be heck to watch a movie with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm good at movies, but, um, but anyway, um, I wanted to talk about this one because, uh, because Dr. Freire is talking about the future of religion and, um, and he ends his book with a coda. And so I just wanna uh, read through it first and have some comments on that. Uh, and, and part of the coda is a poem. And uh, then we'll talk about the difference between uh, the goddess of reason <laughs> and the rest of our life, or our, our life, because uh, reason isn't where we live, uh, as Dr. Young said clearly. Um, so this is a section called Coda in this book, a secret poem for you. I close this book on a more personal note by sharing a poem with you, the reader, a poem that evocatively conveys central elements of the shared participatory relationship humans have with nature and its human and non-human worlds. I call this poem secret, not because of its hermetic or esoteric meaning, but simply because it's secretly held for me for years, giving me strength and hope in times of crisis and difficulty. My father, its author, was born and raised in the orchards of Murcia, M-U-R-C-I-A, how would you pronounce that, um, David? Murcia. 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 Murcia that fertile region of the south of Spain that prides itself in that charmingly exaggerated way so defining of the Mertzian spirit on providing fruits and vegetables for the rest of the European continent. As my father moved to the culturally vibrant but highly industrialized city of Barcelona to work and start his new married life, essential seeds of his soul apparently decided to stay at the orchards. Then, as so often happens within the poet's heart, verse beauty began to sprout from the pain and isolation of a dismembered soul. This is why the poem you are about to read was originally called Solitude. Some years ago, with the author's consent, I changed its title from Solitude to Plentitude for a poem as is true of anything that carries meaning for what matters is never an indifferent or static object, but rather a living presence whose inner nature metamorphos uh, metamorphoses, uh, well, that's a big word for change. Metamorphosizes, <laughs> metamorphosizes. Metamorphosis, uh, object. Okay, so na inner nature metamorphosis object, changes object, okay, but rather a living presence whose inner nature metamorphosis as it encounters a receptive heart. 
As I rescued these, those essential seeds that my father's soul left in Mertian soil, it became obvious that a change of title was not only justified, but actually called for by the poem itself. In these times of rampant uprootedness from ancestry and tradition, we often forget that it is in the unfulfilled dreams of our parents where we can at times find the pearls that offer our souls the guidance they are looking, longing for. What a magnificent miracle it is to discover that as we walk that path, not only the dreams, but also the dreamer can at a deep level begin to be realized. <clears throat> I'm going to read that sentence again because I think it's a, an important one. What a ma magnificent miracle it is to discover that as we walk that path, not only the dreams, but also the dreamer can at a deep level begin to be realized. Although containing many layers of meaning, this is a very simple poem. My father, as Charles Bukowski once said of himself, does not have grandiose thoughts or thoughts of a philosophical nature. And so his poems tell us about very ordinary things. As do many visionary texts, however, this poem lures us into a journey. But this is not an invention of, or this is not an invitation to the hero's journey where a masculinized self leaves its motherland, encounters pitfalls and battles monsters and triumphantly returns with a renewed sense of empowered solar identity. I believe that this poem uh, tells us about a much lesser known kind of initiation where the soul leaves her social, psychological and even spiritual routines to delve anew and without struggle into the deeper sources of life, of nature and of the mystery so that we can return in peace with the flavor of the winds between our hands. <clears throat> Before I leave you to enjoy the poem, however, let me tell you another secret for its magical power to be conjured. This poem needs to be read out loud and with both tenderness and passion. Hence, I invite you to take a deep breath, drop deep into your heart, and allow these words to perhaps narrow the gap between you and your own boundless potential. Okay, it's written here in Spanish and English. Unfortunately, I cannot do justice to the Spanish, so I'm not going to bother the Spanish with my reading. <clears throat> although I'm sure it's quite beautiful in Spanish, but plenitude, plenitude, plenitudes. If one day you cannot find me, do not think that I've gone crazy, but sane. Look for me far away where people fly like birds over immense valleys, where the sad beetles bathe their bodies in dew and cloth and clothe themselves in black velvet. Look for me far away where the cows give milk in abundance and the languid sheep gather like white clouds, where the oxen gaze with gentleness and the horses with peaceful tails. S um, feel the caressing wind and the horses with peaceful tails feel the caressing of the wind where I lay my head down without a watch, measuring the time up the mountain toward the light and the silence. There you will find me lying in the, lying in the grass with time blossoms between my lips, gazing at the condor and at the golden eagles flying and flying. There you will find me learning to live from the insects and from the wild birds, from the domestic animals learning from the birds, from the domestic animals learning from the birds. I do not feel ashamed. 
And it may be that I even learn to fly like the bees, to sleep with the hens and to converse with the lizards. And I will breathe freely against the wind through the highest peaks. I will listen for the voice from afar of the, of the countryman who sings love songs to his beloved and the bronze bell sounding in the far village. I will listen to the voice of the trees, of the breeze and of the water. I will use my new eyes for the first time to look as far as my gaze roams, where the critics sing, where the chicadas sleep. And when you find me, I will kiss your breath with human warmth. And I will tell you what they have taught me, the wind, the day, the night, the light, and the stars. And we will learn together for all time to live in peace with the flavor of the winds between our hands. And by Jose, Jose Antonio Noguera Jimenez. Okay, comments so I can get a grip here. Go ahead. David. Uh... <clears throat> Um, I'm still, I'm still, 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 still. Okay, uh, David, we had, we had, David, stop, 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 stop. stop. We're, we're getting a very bad sound signal from you. Could you log off and come back on? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, yeah, the, the, the thing that's most striking, I've, um, what came to me when you read the preamble, um, the word metaphor, metamorphosis or metamorphosize um, struck me as strangely similar to couple with transpersonal, uh, meta being beyond or um, greater than form mm -hmm. uh, with metamor you know, metamorphosis, the morph being the change. And so bigger change beyond form. And then transpersonal, the, the small that connects to the large, which then goes also beyond form and beyond scale. And I think that um, in that poem, um, especially with the chicadas that will sleep for 17 years in the ground, some species, I think, and then wake up, make a lot of noise, procreate, and then go to sleep again, I mean, or die. And um, there was that whole um, the St. Augustine piece there of being nature. Like we ourselves are capital in nature, which I think is of chief importance that um, civilization in a way has gotten us away from nature. And I find civilization to actually start to be kind of an uncivilized thing when reason is too predominant. And I think that poem with the um, time blooms, T-H-Y-M-E, the herb time, like creeping time or woolly time blooms between his teeth. That line is just so expressive to me, especially if I'm not reading it and I'm hearing it because I, I know the context and it's time, the herb. But when you hear it the first time, you just think this metaphor of time blooms like your watch time like this thing that is so chronologically static and formed opens up and that homonym to me is just really struck me this time that it really worked both ways together right um <clears throat> You know, living by rules um, is all well and good. We have to, we get rules from our parents and from our whole society all the time. Um, but they always crimp our style. This was right. what Dr. Young was talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the words that we hear thrown around a lot in 
in the, at least in this country and probably a lot of other countries, is the word spiritual. And the opposite of spiritual or of the spirit is matter. And the significant thing about um, all life is that it is all, it's all in the spiritual. It's not in mm -hmm. the words. The words are just dead things. And this is something that I repeat over and over again, that nothing in the, in the logos is alive. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just a thing. Um, and life, and, and this is why science hasn't been able to put a, um, I mean, science has been able to give a general outline of what life is, but it's never been able to identify, okay, this is the source of life and um, so on. And, you know, that brings up a, a point I used to, I used to knock home in architecture almost daily is that reasons are unreasonable. And especially when I'm dealing with a visual three-dimensional spatial concept, um, there's a, how does it feel to you quality that's required to play the logic, so to speak, and rework something. But that just reasons are unreasonable. And there was more of a feeling because the reasons become, an, then the rules too, become an average so that they can apply allegedly to everyone, but then they kind of diet, don't yeah. apply to anyone. Yeah, then they don't <laughs> apply to anybody, yeah. right? And, and um, so, and we haven't, uh, we haven't taught our young people to live, okay? We, what we have done uh, is the, the voice of reason has said, oh, well, we don't need to teach art and music in schools because all we need is for people to be able to balance their checkbooks and come to work and do their labor. Uh, and after that, we don't need to teach anybody. Um, but the result of that is what happened on the 6th of January in uh, the US. And so, we have to understand that there are uh, things that are sacred in, in life that we need to respect and we need to learn to respect them. And so we also don't teach social studies because they don't wanna, uh, they, you know, the powers that be thought, oh, well, if, as long as we don't teach social studies, nobody will understand what we're doing. Vanessa has her hand up, so go ahead, Vanessa. Well, when you started today, uh, for some uh, reason, I was thinking about what do we need to do? Where can we go? And my um, thought was we need common sense. And then as you were reading the poem, I thought, how do I mean common sense? And I was thinking about um, me in nature or me being nature and how maybe the closest I've come is learning to sail and then sailing where I am the wind and I am the water and I am the depth and I am um, every aspect so that I can handle being with those elements. I am part of you know, all aspects of it. And so with the time between his teeth, I felt like that's where I'm really close to the insects or, or like the fish and the birds and the everything around because out on the water in a sailboat, you know, handling that myself and feeling every cell having to be awake. And how do we get to the common sense of, of that? And, um, yeah, and I was thinking about the mental health in America and why we don't have a focus on the basic health of each person and the basic health of, you know, being in contact with 
our awareness in nature and of our nature. So that poem was beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, well, I, you know, people and art has, has been uh, driven out of the schools, obviously. And, um, and what we have to understand is that um, art is where we live. Okay, in other words, um, the creation of things, whatever it is, gives our soul meaning, even if it's the creation of a highway, okay, and we're following the, the rules of the architect or the, uh, the um, you know, the highway engineer, um, you know, building a highway is a soulful task. Um, and, but the highway itself isn't alive. The highway itself serves life. Um, and, you know, the same with all things that are produced by the logos. I mean, okay, I have a coffee cup here and uh, that serves my life because it allows my wife to bring me a cup of coffee early in the morning on Sunday morning. Um, and we needed logos 100%, not only to produce the coffee, but also to put the seal of my co co or college on the coffee cup, I have to get it up there we go. Okay, so there's the seal of my college. And what the seal of the college has on it is um, the angel Gabriel. I think I'll take off my background for a minute so that you can see this. Um, so the, the seal of the co college has uh, the angel Gabriel uh, removing a hood from the head of uh, a young person uh, so that they can see. And on the book uh, is written, looks at veritas, light and truth. And, um, and so the point of it is, uh, and then in Greek, uh, the words uh, know thyself. Um, and so the point is, of course, that older people teach younger people um, what the what truth is and, and what you know how to how to live lives. And there's an old quote too that goes right with that: that art drives culture, technology simply supports it, like a toothpick after dinner. Yeah. And, you know, it, the <clears throat> toothpick and the, even sometimes the dinner is there to support, but the art is what really fills the soul and gives the gas tank, so to speak, uh, reason, if you will, to do anything. Yeah. Right. And, and so you can, you can feel your life in a poem or in a work of art. Um, whereas, you know, there's no, there is no life in all the objects in your room. Um, it's only, um, you know, they only support your life and you may have thought they were beautiful at one time and therefore you have them in your room. But uh, none, nonetheless, I think we, most of us have a lot of dross in our rooms. <laughs> I certainly do have mm -hmm. plenty of it. Um, but we need, to, we need to get back to understanding what, what is life and uh, understanding that, uh, you know, life is not in the, the word and God is not the word. God, you can point to God with a word, but the life and the light is something else. And even John 1, 1 through 5 um, say that very clearly. But if you only go as far as John 1, 1, uh, then, then you're stuck in words, which is exactly what Dr. Jung was talking about. And the, so, words, the words are vessels. And the vessels, though, need to be filled. They're there for containment to hold something more valuable when that's the life that's poured into them. 
Right. And the uh, words are also symbols. So they, mm-hmm. um, they aren't anything unto themselves. They're a symbol of something that means something to you. And um, so I'm going to show you another poem here in a moment, one that I wrote uh, 27 years ago now, but um, I actually wrote an entire book of poetry (laughs) under a pen name. Um, And um, it's the, the book. Okay. Here's a deep, dark secret. The book is about um, the art of seduction and how to communicate with the woman. And uh, so I'm not gonna read some of the more risque parts, but- uh, So it's very French. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's it's called, uh, what did I call it? Um, Geez, I can't even remember the name of my own book. So that's, that's not, uh, right. Uh, oh, I know. It's, um, I, I wanted to call it S- The Seduction. And what my local bookstore guy, who was an Indian American, suggested that I call it uh, Seduction for the Soul. Uh, because in the New Age, the soul was becoming a more prominent thing. And so uh, it's actually called Seduction for the Soul. And it's under my pen name, which is David Gerritsen, G-E-R-R-I-T-S-A-N, and uh, which actually relates to our, Japanese? Our, no, our original family name. Yeah, as a- Gerritsen. Well, it, the the first ancestor of all Conovers, and Conover is a made up name like many names in uh, North America, but um, it's a made up name because uh, the original ancestor who came to North America with his three sons and his wife, they became five of the first 150 European settlers of Manhattan. And that happened in 1625. So we're going to celebrate the 400th anniversary here quite soon. Um, But his name was um, Wolfert Gerritsen. And in those days, that meant Wolfert, son of Garrett. Uh, And so they only would say, this is the son of this other guy, (laughs) right? (laughs) Basically in that part of uh, Holland. And um, so it was Wilfred, the son of Garrett, basically. But when they arrived in the new world, they would say where they were from in Europe. And so uh, in those days, it, uh, he was from a village, which is now right in Centrum in Amersfoort, Amersfoort the Netherlands. Um, but in the old in the old days, it was two two miles out of town, <laughs> and so it it was a village called Cohenhofen. And if you go to um, if you go to the Amsterdam Central Station, you can still take a bus from uh, the Central Station in Amsterdam that has across the top its destination is Cohenhofen. So. <laughs> Uh, and um, so anyway, Wolfert came to the New World, and on the documents, he was Wolfert Gerritsen von Cohenhofen, but Sen, S-E-N. I changed it to San uh, to have this Japanese flavor, um, and uh, so it's Wolfert Gerritsen, uh, or um, David Gerritsen is the uh, pen name I chose, but, uh, but anyway, the story goes, okay, so Ben Cohenhoven became our family name for about uh, almost 200 years. Then in 1820, they decided that it was too cumbersome. So they changed it to Conover. And uh, so that's the story of the name Conover, which is a made up uh, American name uh, with Dutch origin. But anyway, going back to my book, uh, 
I wrote all these poems about seduction. And uh, so I'm gonna to read to you one. And uh, the origin of this poem was that at the time in 1993, I was invited to, um, to do a poetry reading at the Martin Luther King Library in, in Washington, DC. And um, I didn't know what that was going to mean, but I was preparing for that poetry reading. And um, I, at the same time, I was reading uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes's books. And one of the books was uh, What Women Dream. Okay, and so I said, said to myself, hmm, that's interesting. What do women dream? And if, if I write a poem about what women dream, maybe that's a way to have an unconscious connection with women. That was the idea anyway. And so I read this book and uh, I finished it the day before the, the reading. And then all of a sudden, boom, this poem popped out of my head. So it's based on what women dream. And, uh, and so let's see if you think this is alive, okay. Um, and uh, by the way, I, I'll actually show it to you so that you can see the, see the poem. Um, okay, so here it is. The Whale and the Horse. I dreamed I was a mighty whale and you a majestic white horse who lived on an arid plain so stale you couldn't find love's source. My habitat was a blue-green cove where I often swam and dove. And though our forms were sealed by fate, we found we could communicate. You often came to a cliff edge where you could see me swim. You found a path beyond the ledge where you, could, you followed your precious whim to step gingerly down the path through thorns to my white sand beach where you could touch my warm moist bath, allowing me to teach of joys of life and joys of love from many years ago, before the strife, beyond the strife of thorns above in precious realms below. But when I looked at your foreleg, I saw a bloody stream of bright red ooze from thorny peg, nightmare within a dream. I bade you join my moist pleasure, but you couldn't stand the sting. I gave the secret of my treasure, the bomb for which men sing. Your hooves dug deep, you wouldn't weep. You found my amber ball. You stove it in, released within its vapor, raised the paw. Now free to run and have some fun, you galloped in the surf. You ducked your head into the foam, then dove into my turf. We swam and dove inside my cove until on one deep dive, we surfaced for breath, defeating death, and flew up, up alive. We flew above your arid plain and dripped our splashing waters, and everywhere our bodies dripped. The, tree, the trees gave birth to daughters. We cavorted nearly every day until the plain was lush, and then returned unto the bay where we found your belly plush. With the fruits of love's wisdom transcending the, our kingdom, of time and space we all know. Our child brought our freedom to fathom the wisdom of leaving life's flow to love's glow. So that's my famous poem. That's quite a fairy tale. Yeah. It um, turned into. And, um, you know, most people that pay any attention to that poem at all, um, say that they see something different in it every time they, they read it. Um, and indeed I do as well. Um, and obviously it contains lots of metaphors. It forces you out of your humdrum logo stay. <laughs> and, and, um, and you can see how it's very meaningful to women because of combines all these dreams that women have and almost every line contains a, uh, a, a reference to 
women's dreams, as Estes um, pointed out. Uh, actually sent it to her one Well, time. in that regard, I mean, would Vanessa or Juan have comment? Yeah, Vanessa, any, any thoughts? Well, um, I also saw it in fairy tale imagery and, and was sort of visualizing um, the characters and, and the uh elements like the horse going into the water and everything and um yeah the the sense of coming together and finding love and creating together and and um yeah just that dance it's it's quite interesting i would i would read it again maybe to comment on a more my first my first reaction is is the, the motion and the um these two creatures that are so different finding a play together so it's it, yeah. That's where i went to the peering over the ledge and, and there was the kind of shall we will you you know shall you dance i mean it it turned into that kind of um it went from meeting to naturalizing, to lineage. I mean, it was, there's a whole life cycle there that was, uh, I think, lush. Right. And uh, the interesting thing I find is that it, it's also about alchemy um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's about, um, you know, of, of course, in what we call real life, there can be no uh, child between a whale and a horse, but in our, in our imagery, in our um, in our uh, imagination, there can be. Um, well, and the horse is the mind, and the whale is the unconscious, and the you know masculine and the feminine, and the uniting of them coming together, not as one, but as a couple. I mean, their identities, there's dignity and difference in their identities, and they yeah. they don't merge so much as they join. And and one thing I noticed was you know, the horse having uh, pain comes from the journey through the thorns. And so going into salt water, that would sting. Yeah. And I'm wondering about the whale's pain. And what comes to me is, you know, how whales are suffering from the sound now that the whales um, are, are damaged from all the sounds. I used to live by the ocean and watched whales get beached and die because we couldn't get them back in the water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I relate to both the suffering of both animals. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And uh, uh, so, David, you had a comment. You wanted to have a comment, so go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, th thank you for reading the poem. I'd love, I'd love okay. to read it again. Um, Okay, uh, uh, somehow can you sit closer to your mic or something because yeah. we're not better? hearing you well. Okay, uh, marginally. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, that's that's better. Go ahead. That better. Yeah, I was. Uh, it's to me the poem is is about the conjunction of opposites, and the transcendent function, and you mm -hmm. know it it ends with the trans the transcendent function in the sense that a child is born. And, yeah. um, you know, and basically we always kind of roll back to, you know, this, this uh, 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 same paradigm. Yeah, which is a symbol and, and so on. And yes, we do roll back to it. And at the time that I wrote that, I didn't know enough about Jungian psychology. I knew some, th some things about it, but not, not that much. Um, and, uh, and yet when I... Now in the fullness of time, 27 years later, I can look back on writing that poem and see how it really captures the essence of Jungian psychology. Can, and it's can, actually, can I, I would share, say, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Just, uh, can, I, can I share an image on the screen? Uh, sure. Let me see if I can. Let's see if I can. No, it's just, just, yeah, just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. It's kind of synchronistic, that's why I... Okay, yeah, go ahead. I did. Um, should be able to do it now. Yeah. No. Won't let me. No, it won't let me. You know, Rocket King on the YouTube chat says, 
at the sa same time of seeing the narrative play out in my head, I also saw the well and the horse's respective domains swirl in a large elemental Taoist symbol. Interesting. Nice. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't share. It doesn't work. I'm not allowed to share. Hmm. It should be able to just a minute. Let me, let me try again. Uh, it's no, it's no big deal. Oh, mean. wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I had to there do you go. Try now. Yeah, try it now. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I like it because it's the whale and it's, you know, it's really the notion of the unconscious, which is, I mean, here we see sailors and it's actually written uh, below that, uh, that uh, people, I mean, these sailors don't understand that actually they've landed on a whale and they're actually cooking dinner. <laughs> and, you know, and it really symbolizes, you know, uh, uh, you know our, our stance pertaining to the unconscious and the fact that the whale is, you know, sort of, it's, I've, I've found a lot of images like this one with whales. Huh? And even, uh, well, no, in, uh, in the Red Book, there's also an image of a ship and there's a sort of like yes. a sea monster be uh, below her. Huh? But it's uh, but the way it is 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 quite obviously a, a very good archetype for for the unconscious. Yes. Well, and that that whale is consuming the fish that then they are making yeah. dinner. There's a whole cycle here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I do have a lot of the red book images, so I'll see if I can pull up. That's that. a that's a that's a great one. That. Um, well, well, especially the, the, the whale ingesting the fish. So it's taking nourishment in and they're cooking dinner out. I mean, so in a sense, the chimney on the top of the blowhole of the whale. Yeah, um, it's, it's autonomous. It's really the notion yeah. of, you know, the unconscious being so autonomous. Yeah, right. Yeah. So there's the there's the red book image. Um. <clears throat> and it's the, the four armed uh, sailor which mm -hmm. symbolizes, I guess, you know, the four function, uh, the, the four psychological functions. And of course it's carrying the self. Right. Uh, yeah. Which is represented by this golden globe. Yeah. But it's, I often, you know, when I, when I, when I speak to, you know, people sort of normal people <laughs> who don't spend <laughs> their time, you know, studying psychology or, 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 or analytical psychology that, you know, a very good, uh, a very good uh, example of of of, 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 of uh, the the uh, the unconscious is the sea because it's you know right it holds so many you know so many different contents right. and we're just a ship you know right. we think that we're on a solid ground but you know as Freud used to say you know that uh, yeah we 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 actually sitting on a on a horse but we could you gents continue on for a moment I need to yeah. take a short break. Certainly. Yeah, that's that's a great point, David, that the earth is the metaphor for the unconscious and we're just on a horse um, that it alludes to the smallness and the largeness and, you know, no value judgment on the size there. It's the both and of that continuum of um, the interweaving and the inter interdependent. I think the word I like to use instead of, I mean, there's a lot of codependence, but it's the interdependence that's the healthy quality. And the ability to navigate um, arabesques, for lack of a better word. I mean, they're, they're just kind of moving around in a, a relatively baroque way. Um, I guess as long as they don't go all the way to the Chirigaresque, which is kind of garish and overgrown architecture, so to speak. But there is that, you know, nature will kill you. And um, it also will love you very much. And, and then neither, because it's just weather. And the ability yeah. to feel that. Are you scared? Oh, go ahead, Vanessa. Um, okay. Excuse me, it. I just had an interruption. Um, I was just thinking about um, how we go from uh, the codependency society that we're in into the understanding of inner dependence, which is like you're speaking healthy, um, relating to our own nature in nature, you know, what, what can help move us that direction of better understanding the problem with codependency? 
I, that's that's one. That's a lifelong question and a good one. I mean, uh, David may be more apt um, to speak directly from a professional standpoint. My personal gig is um, I grew up with quite a lot of discipline in martial arts, but that was only there to provide a cornerstone to brace against for what was really valuable that needed to happen. That was always expressed that the discipline of the ritual just takes the body out of the way, but does not defeat the body from a kind of a shamanic perspective, the body comes first. And I think from that perspective, there was always, if you fine tune yourself, then you outpour and these other artistic forms. And I feel that just the visceral experience of that was one of the pieces, Vanessa, that I see. I mean, David? Uh, too many thoughts come to my mind, but you know, I mean, I would, I would say that it's a very tricky game. I mean, uh, uh, the relationship between the, the I and the unconscious. You say the I in English, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, I and the unconscious. I, I had it back and, uh, like the in I the, am I, in, right? Sorry? Like the I am I. Yeah, yeah, the I am. Yes, yeah. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the, you know, in, in, in the Bible, you know, when, when God creates Eve from, from, from Adam, it's actually written, you know, or the different versions I've, I've read anyway, that, you know, it's, he closes up the wound. It's close. So we, are, we are separated from the unconscious. I mean, and when we're not separated from the unconscious, it really, uh, it gives some very, you know, special results, you know, that, you know, people who are always like invaded by the unconscious contents. And I think I, I can relate to that at least. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, period. And, um, and um, uh, uh, so, you know, we are on one side, we have to like make sure that we don't get sort of invaded, contaminated. But on the other side, we need to make for the, uh, for the transcendent function. And just to roll back to what was said at the beginning uh, um, of, of, of this session is that you see, I mean, I'm seeing it from the other side of the pond, but what is happening uh, uh, in the United States, it's, you know, obviously we want reason and order and stuff because you know, that's the only thing that you know, would allow us to survive basically. But on the other hand, we should value, I mean, one should value what is happening and understand it and that these people, you know, how, however archaic and brutal and, and, and elementary they, 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 they might be, they come with a message, mm -hmm. which is an important message. Really, about our, I mean, ourselves, I would say yourself, you, you guys, but it's true everywhere, you know, and it's true on the, on the, on the, on the personal level and it's true obviously on the collective level. So, yeah. Well, Young talked about the fact that we're, um, you know, we, we live among people who are in 10,000 years worth of psychological development. And so we never know when we're going to meet the caveman on the street. And the issue with our president is that he, no one ever said no to him or, and got away with it anyway, okay? <laughs> Maybe his father did at one point by sending him off to military school, but he just rebelled against that, obviously. And, um, and so he never learned to stop and smell the roses properly. And he never, oh, and part, go ahead. I was going to say, and in that too, he had a monster of a father, but a doormat for a mother. So his unconscious transcendent function was never even given a nod, much right. less that it should be in, of any interest as an off-road from the highway, so right. to speak. I mean, yeah. and Vernessa, I think to speak again to what David was saying with the transcendent function, Martin Buber has a wonderful book called I and Thou. Yeah. And it really pushes that home from not just the small and the large of the horse and the whale, um, right. but something beyond both of them, that together there's a, the eye of we and the eye of I am. And there's the, that transcendent function, I think, David, that you brought up is, is of so 
so much utter importance. Um, and specifically, simply, where art brings this in without a lot of syllables, so to speak. Right. Now, one of the things that I wanted to bring forth here uh, was that in the logos, there are no senses. Okay. In other words, uh, it's all up in the head. Uh, and, <clears throat> and therefore, um, it doesn't really, the logos isn't really speaking to our life per se. And if we live li our lives only by rules, then eventually, you know, life just becomes um, gray. It's not, you know, you don't have any value. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm always reminded of Winston Churchill's comment when he was asked um, during World War II why he was still funding the British Museum uh, for millions of pounds a year when they were fighting a war. And he said, well, if, we, uh, if we're not going to save that, then what are we fighting for? Right. And, um, and the point is that we have to have our senses engage and, um, you know, in, in the case of a, a psychic epidemic like last week, obviously senses engaged, but it, 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 they engaged with a very uh, barbaric um, element in the human species. And, you know, the problem with the president is he can, he can think of all this stuff to do to, to drive everybody nuts, um, but uh, he doesn't understand that, no, that it's never going to happen the way you think it is like that. I mean, he, he just didn't, he can't comprehend that. And so, yes, he can force the Marine Corps band to play ruffles and flourishes for him because he was elected, but uh, you can bet that probably a lot of those members of the band don't think he deserves it uh, because he hasn't earned it. And David, it, it, you brought up a great point, David, with also it, they have a message and I, I don't want to um, be too simplistic and overgeneralize, but, but I will, because it seems to me that one of the primary pieces is shame and trauma because it's it's like an acting out when someone gets triggered except on a national scale and these people instead of being said to never told no on the other hand these people have almost always been told only no and the loud environments and well, just and general they, trauma they don't feel a part of of society obviously right and yeah so, so they never they, really they, log that. they logically think that that force is a thing that they can impose yeah, but upon I, us. I, 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 would, uh, I think it's important to really understand, you know, the same in the same way. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, uh, referring to Jung. Uh, uh, Wotan was at work. You know, that's what Jung sure. said. You know, in 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 the in the in the thirties. And, and here we have something similar. I don't know if it's Votan because I don't think it really belongs, but it could belong when you see the horns and stuff, you know, there could be something, you know. Uh, uh, that's, that's one point. But the other point is that uh, the solution usually, you know, it usually stems from the inferior function. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm referring to the types. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. the same way Cinderella is the one, you know, he, she, she's the one left behind, you know, the two sisters and, and the, and the mother-in-law or whatever. And, and, but she comes, you know, she, she comes back with, with the treasures sort of thing. And I mean, yeah. there's loads of tales and stuff. So okay, there's a, there's we a question. Need to stay open. I mean, I, I would say, you know, uh, have a lot of uh, open-mindedness and, and, and willingness mm -hmm. to, take a, a hard look at what's going on and just not push these guys like you animals, you idiots, you unhappy and divine. Right, we have to include them. 
Uh, you got to get past and, the us and the them, and there's an I and a thou, and we are all the thou together. So, right, I mean, the, right. the sickness is as much our own as it is anyone else's. Yeah, and that, that was yeah. a criticism I had during our first Google session where some of the folks that were participating were, uh, or I'm sorry, our doodle session, where some of the participants were beating up on men and I, I said, wait a minute, you know, these are, these are men just like the men that served in the Marines with me. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of them saved my life. And, um, but it, there's a comment here from R.T. Moody on the, uh, on the YouTube question. So, sorry, but I have a question that requires your expertise. What is the term which refers to both the anima and the animus. I think it starts with an S. Please help writing a book and can't find the answer. Would that word be soul? <laughs> soul, self. Yeah, um, soul, self. Capital S, self. Yep. Um, I, I wonder if he's going into samadhi, though. The, um, but I. Yeah, it could be. Could be. Um, in, in, if, uh, you... I think Martin Buber uses a word which is Shekina, which is which is a, actually is Shekina, Shekina, yeah. which is like the unconscious, you know, so undifferentiated, unconscious. Because Shekina is the a, wife of God. I mean, the original yeah. first one. I, right. He it's, had a history too. So it's yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, anima and animus are the are the filter through which uh, we see the world. Um, uh, or the self sees the world. Um, I think that's a good point, David. That maybe he he should look up Shakina, and that's S H E K H I N A, Shakina. Right. Now I wanted to go back to religion um, because um, I think I, I was referring to the senses and how the um, poems engage us because they engage our senses. Um, even though, um, oh, and Rocket King says syzygy. Yeah, it could be syzygy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, syzygy. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, syzygy is probably the word you're referring to. Okay. In this movie because I think uh, it's funny. I that didn't come to mind because I say that's my yeah. favorite word on the planet. <laughs> right. Syzygy <laughs> is. How do you spell it? Syzygy. S Y Z Y G Y. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. Right. It, mean, it means yoked together. And uh, we, we all have atom and animus within it's, us. Yeah, it's an astrological term. It's right. right. And, the and oppositions. It, and it's, up, yeah. and it, it, it's the same as yin and yang. Okay. To the right. Astrologically, it's across the chart and the oppositions. They're in a binary <laughs> star orbit. So another word, uh, a smaller inferior function word would be tandem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. Uh, Syzygy just incorporates the thou, though. Tandem could be a trailer, and then right. that, that's all logos. So, okay. So, I wanted to talk about one of the roles of religion in the context of senses, because again, um, the logos doesn't typically engage our senses per se. Uh, except maybe we see the, the results of the logos. Um, and, um, and so I think what's notable, for example, in the Catholic Church, where, which I'm not a follower of, but uh, you have incense and you have, you know, a, a smorgasbord of visual sights and uh, bells sound and, and you have the ritual uh, going on and so on. So it's engaging the senses. And it's clear to me that uh, whatever we call it, um, we, need, we need something to engage our spirit, okay? With, with the duality, with the syzygy being matter and spirit, matter and um, matter and energy, if you will, you know, E equals MC square is right there also. Um, and, um, you know, as long as we're just 
a rock <laughs> floating around in space, we're surely not alive. But when, when energy somehow gets in, introduced to that rock and therefore causes life, um, then, then we have something. And, and it's something that religions have always provided, but we have to distinguish between spirit, spirituality, and religion, because re religion is actually structure. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's actually logos. And so whenever the priests or the, the mullahs or whoever it is uh, creates a religion, they're creating a structure that again now is out of spirituality and and so they can bring you as deb was saying the other day they can bring you up to the to the ledge but they can't take you over okay they, um, mm -hmm. necessarily okay and and so but there is a place for religions obviously because uh people who follow a religion and learn the stories, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what, what the religion is, whatever it is that that's what their role to bring you to a certain point, but eventually you have to step off uh, and, and see the value of it for yourself. And well, so, you know, in these times, I mean, uh, there's another inference of logos that is for in a more, a more undeveloped psyche is simply that which is outside of me so that that little baby i ego so to speak and there's a lot of that going on where then that's why taking a walk in nature to enact the spirit you have the living logos uh, it's not logos at all it's it's life but it's outside of me and you start to then be able to discern what is outside of me that's an object logos versus what is outside of me that is living also alongside or with me. And so well, that's and in, in me and too. in me. So if right. I look over at my dog, well, there's logos being outside myself, except that I know to, Oh, she's alive. Yeah. So there's another being to then commune, connect, um, right. And cohabitate the, with and the point of those poems that I read both Ferrer's and mine was that um, you can feel your life within the poem. Okay? Yes. In other words, everybody has to live the life of that. And this is why art is so important. I mean, there's stories about how um, people, some people go into an art museum and they just are in tears constantly and I you know I was always a very logos guy in terms of my training and education and so I never felt that at all until 1995 when I walked into the Boston Museum of Art and I walked up to a, a um, well the first thing that happened was I walked into a room that had a dining room table that was three times normal size, table and six chairs. It consumed the entire room and you walk into it and immediately you walk under the table and it instantly puts you back to being three years old. And you can definitely feel something happen there. Okay, so that, mm -hmm. was, that was the first thing that happened. But then I walked into this room with this Jackson Pollock, which I had always, never understood, you know, I, I said, geez, can kindergartners do that? Um, you know, what, what is it about Pollock? And I walk into this room and I simply began to weep mm -hmm. and I didn't know why for 20 years until um, one of my uh, fellow participants in this group local participants said olive drab and he connected me up with the fact that i had not mourned the loss of my um my roommate from the basic school in the marine corps who had died five months after we graduated from the basic school of second lieutenants and um and so that light that aspect of my life had been 
forced aside by logos, you know, okay. All right, well, Bob's dead, but I'm going to go on living and, you know, boom, 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 and never really appreciating what his life meant to my life and made my life possible in many ways. Um, Skip, what do you think about Pollock's paintings? Uh, release that. Say it again, Vanessa. What do you think about uh, standing in front of Pollock's Pollock's paintings released that in you or uh, allowed you to connect? Well, it was the painting plus the two words because I didn't, when I saw the painting, I didn't make the connection at all. Uh, but when I described this situation to Bill Woodard, who's a friend of mine, um, he said, he just, I, I described the painting as being uh, greens and blacks and browns and so on. And, um, and he said, olive drab. Okay. And that instantly connected me. Okay. And that uh, actually, if you look at um, uh, my talk called Finding the Living God, uh, which is on the homepage of this YouTube channel, uh, you can find in that talk, I, I've spliced in those moments of that session where he got me, okay? He said, I, I actually had video going on my, on my iPhone of it. And, and so you can hear Bill say olive drab, and then you can just see the tears welling up. And, and I definitely had a, a very, um, a very visceral experience that connected me up with that event that happened 20 years earlier. And so it was, so what it was, was that reminded me of my Vietnam experience. And so I can um, just show you that because. And I can, I can resonate and um, be right there with you with that. The first time I encountered a Pollock, um, when I walked in, my whole chest kind of heaved forward and there were ablution tingles head to toe, yeah. just that cascade. And I never had that feeling unless I'm in capital N nature. And I felt, wow, he has left nature on this canvas. And right. so to me, it was, it was still alive because there's an energetic signature that that was simply present. So I, th I, I felt like nature was invoked from my perspective. Right. And it, Here's your, your this portrait. Is, this is my self portrait. And so you can see, uh, you know, this is the way I paint, which is expressionist, I think. And um, so you can see back here, this is very Pollock like in a way. And um, this you know, when I, when I've completed this portrait, I said, I don't have anything to say about the Vietnam War anymore because it's all right here. And it's all in the white of my left eye here. That's, mm -hmm. that's the summation of everything I have to say about the Vietnam War. And, um, and so when, I wasn't thinking of that portrait per se, but I, you know, obviously when he said that, it connected me with what I had seen in the Pollock. And I said, aha, that's it. And well, so your, your experience with Pollock was far beyond words. And mm. your friend who put words to them, it's like pulling in a fish from the ocean. Exactly, exactly like that. Um, or even yeah. that's a wonderful example, Vanessa, because then even in Jung's work, he says it's like getting as far as you can into the unconscious, yet you take out your fishing rod, you cast further, and you yank the glowing eyed fish from the deep. And yeah. well that's said. that. <laughs> right. And, and so it, you know, it's the same thing as, as the poem that I was reading, or the two poems I was reading, because they both connect with us 
in a in a very deep way you know people everybody who was commenting on it here said you know that i could see the imagery and so on and um and so moses did trump get his logo from an old book or something the snake in trump's logo kind of wakes people but the guys holding the flag didn't get it well i don't know what logo he's talking about do you know of trump having a logo not with the serpent on it but i also i avoid i i, I try not to step on scorpion so i walk around him uh, right typically so i, I kind of right. I, I, I am guilty of avoidance there yeah so and Ma magic sufi says the war is still going on the war is always going on okay and and so but the point is that we have to educate our young and and we have to educate our young about the about the arrow's side as well because okay somebody that doesn't have any connection with the arrow's side can be persuaded by some sort of wacko wackadoodle logic to come and attack the u.s capitol um you know and you know people who've been uh, marginalized, let's say, um, can go out in the woods and, and it feels good to shoot a, shoot a automatic weapon and, and be able to hit a target. That's very Logos type of thing, right? But then that doesn't mean, just because that feels good, um, doesn't mean that you, you should attack civilization. Okay. Well, and, and targets don't hit, like Bruce Lee might say, targets don't hit back. Right. And, 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 the, and the point is that our president never had the experiences that are necessary to understand that you can't do that. Okay. And, and so this is why uh, we've had generals who are presidents and they've been good presidents typically. Um, and it's why it's not a bad idea to have a former military guy as a president because those people have been forced through various stages of consciousness that you don't just get off the street. And of course, if nobody says no to you and gives you everything you want, then um, Then you can just go off wackadoodle, right? Well, you know what's coming to mind with the you know the war is still going on. Something I think I was six, maybe seven. Um, uh, my grandmother, um, quite a firecracker, just a wonder, wonderful woman, and she. Um, we were, I think, I think we were headed to a movie, something mundane, but someone recognized her as the the wife of the minister and runs up and starts. Helen, the world's coming to an end and just started going off on that kind of that trope. And um, she just chuckled and she said, honey, the war is always going on inside. Bring an umbrella. The world's always going to end. Let me tell you, there are only two days a year you can't do anything. And that's yesterday and tomorrow. So please stop tripping on things in your past. And I, right. I, I, I will never forget. I mean, it was such an indelible image. She had encapsulated almost every piece of wisdom I might ever need again. I mean, if it's raining, take an umbrella. If it's sunny, take a friend. You know, it's right. like. Well, and, you know, a perfect example of this is uh, Florence Foster Jenkins. Um, because if you don't have trauma, if you don't, people don't say no to you then you can go off crazy. So there's this movie that Meryl Streep did called Florence Foster Jenkins. She was a real woman. Um, she was an extremely wealthy woman. Um, and uh, she loved the opera and she thought she could sing opera and no one would ever tell her that <laughs> she that was flat. <laughs> she was that she was terrible, right? Yeah, Nobody would tell her that. Oh okay, so so 
finally, uh, and it's, it's a, in, in some ways it's a hilarious movie because, um, and, and these events actually occurred. So, right. um, so she, she gets to the point where, where she, her husband buys all the tickets so that she can perform one time at the Met. Okay, so he, he, he buys her one night at Carnegie Hall as the lead in some opera. I don't remember what the opera was, but she actually um, performed. And it happened that it was right at the end of World War II. So there were a lot of soldiers coming back uh, from World War II going through New York City at the time. And so he wanted to fill the hall. So he bought all these tickets and he handed them out on the streets to anybody who would take the tickets. So all these soldiers come into, into Carnegie Hall and uh, it becomes a raucous event. And, um, but, and, Funnily, um, her performance was recorded and the, at the gift shop of the Metropolitan Opera, that's the most popular item in the gift <laughs> shop, which is the recording of her performance. <laughs> that's, like, that's like William Hung on American Idol and he fin he's flat, he can't sing at all. And it's actually, even if you don't have perfect pitch, <clears throat> you're in pain. And, and and at the end he said, and I have no formal training in singing. And then they say, oh, really? <laughs> so yeah. so um, Magic Sufi says, the war is still going on. I think we commented on that. And then any belief in an outside authority is anathema uh, to individuation. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think that's- Yeah, self-sovereignty. Yeah. And that's, I think- right. What David was alluding to there too earlier. I'm I'm a little uncomfortable, you know, putting everything in in um, in one bucket. You know, I mean, yeah. for example, Islam and 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 Christianity are two very different religions. I mean, not only you know in the way that they, they experience, but Islam's Islam's goal is to connect with the unconscious. Right. And, right. And, and, and it, this is my theory, Did, you know, this is why women are veiled because else they would be the unconscious, you know? So in order to make sure that, you know, that road is clear, we veil, you know, we, we, we put aside what could be mistaken uh, 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 with the unconscious. That's and, an interesting point. Yeah, and, and so, and the, the, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert, but I know a little, and, and, and uh, uh, there's no there's no real structure in Islam. You can I mean, of course, you, you, you have the Quran and the Hadiths, but basically the road to God is open. Yeah, they, to have a direct experience, not not and, through a minister. And, and, right. Yeah. And, and and five times a day within, you know, and you where, where you know, whereas in Christianity or Judaism, you know, it's, it's very different. But I just wanted to also roll back to, uh, you know, this thing about Logos and Eros, which, I mean, I like it on the, I, 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 I like the Taoist approach, you know, the, the, the yin and yang, yin yang, because you're not supposed to say yin and yang, because they're together. I'm, anyway, uh, uh, which is, you know, on one side, uh, 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 the creator, and on the other side, the receptive. Mm -hmm. which yeah. Logos would be the creator. And they right. work together. There's no way, you know, to, to me, in my understanding, there's no way that, you know, you could be like on, you know, one would function without the other. There's one thing for certain, if all the energy is being mobilized on one end, then the other end is getting more and more archaic and more and, 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 and building up violence because right, it, right. Won't, it won't be able to express itself, you know, in like uh, in finesse, uh, 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 ways so usually right. the reaction is very very brutal so right you know. so and that's what the reaction was a couple Wednesdays ago and also with the goddess of reason in Notre Dame same thing okay where where reason got out of control and uh, they say very logically oh you know 
you know, we can just throw religion over, but you can't. Okay, so now well, I want to, I want to real quickly. What's to, interesting between, I mean, the goddess of reason and then raison d'etre, the, the the reason to be, um, are total poles on that continuum. Also, yeah, okay. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, David, but uh, all right. So the raison uh, I, I see Gunner's here. Do you have any any thoughts, Gunner? Uh, before we continue on, because I want to talk about um, the future of religion here briefly. Um, he but... had an interesting comment, I think, in the chat um, in regards to male, uh, Robert Bly and the male mode of feeling being lost. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, initially I got very interested in, in uh, Jordan Peterson, if you remember. And... Yeah. Before that, I was also very attracted to Robert Bly, if you were familiar with his men's yep. movement. Mm -hmm. Men's movement. Yeah, I mean, those guys, when they were doing that, they would, they would connect men uh, by uh, starting with the drumming so that there would be drummers in the, in the room. And it wouldn't be like traditional stare, snare drummers like the... No, more the, shamanic. Yeah, um, shamanic type of drumming, but it it gets the juices running, right? <laughs> and well, it's the heartbeat of the soul, and you start right. to rhythmically sync or not sync. I mean, you you right. you get a sense of yourself, whether you connect or not. You're aware of where you are in that connection or lack thereof, and even just the awareness of it brings you brings you in. Yeah, they they never connected it up for me. Gunner, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I listened to the many of the tapes and, you know, James Hillman was a big leader in that group also. And um, what, what I never saw was the, the connection between the poems that they were reading or the, um, you know, the drumming or whatever it was they were doing and my life. I, I said, okay, it's the men's movement, but wh what are they moving us to? And I, I still have trouble with that. Now, I, at this point, I see that they're trying to connect us up with our senses. And I understand that and with, with the arrow side, but they never connected it in a way that I could grok it in my, in my thinking function. Well, Robert Bly's bag, you know, that we all drag, he said, um, oftentimes there was a lot of focus on that bag, except not to unpack the message so you can walk around without a bag. Um, and so it's interesting that I, I had a similar experience because I, I participated in a lot of drum circles um, in, in Denver. And um, it's interesting to me that you can almost say anything and I'll go, Oh, there's some, cause you're just, you're swimming in it. It doesn't yeah. have to have reason, but I remember they started reading a poem and I just kind of cocked my head and went, uh, uh, not so much. And it brought me right back to, no, I don't want to listen to that. So it's, it's, I appreciate Gunnar, your perspective there. Cause I was really into Robert Bly. And then I, someone read him and at a drum circle and all of a sudden it just flipped a switch in me, which was interesting. I mean, at best. Yeah. I don't remember which, which piece it was though, no, which may I, be actually. Gunnar, I'm trying to understand your point about how this, that was similar to Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Because I think uh, with us young men today, we are becoming more detached from both religion and our past. And uh, what I think brought us attention to Robert Bly and maybe Jordan Peterson is that they were bringing back life into our, our mythologies and, and attaching, attaching meaning to our suffering. And right, right. when we have meaning in our suffering, we can face life much more easily. So uh, yeah, I I that's what I'm trying to come across. Right, but I, but you can talk about meaning all day, but you have to actually bring it to meaning. I mean, you know, you can talk about having a child, 
all all day long and you know what does that mean but when you're there at the birth of your child and they put the baby in swaddling clothes and put it in your arms oh my god that that changes everything right and um you know i had this experience with my first daughter who was uh, 10 weeks early, I was born 10 weeks early. And um, she weighed two pounds and four ounces when she was born. And um, they, uh, you know, right away, I mean, it so happened that in that case, I was present for my second and third daughter's birth, but I wasn't present for her birth because um, my wife had been having difficulties with the pregnancy for about a month. And um, we had been exhausted and I was trying to work on a Saturday. And so I was in my office and all of a sudden she calls me and uh, tells me what she was experiencing. And I said, don't call me, call the ambulance. <laughs> and and uh, fortunately um, she, got to the hospital and the baby was delivered right away. Um, and so I came in and the very one of the very first things that they did was put her in my arms and uh, wrap her in a blanket and, and give her to me to me to hold. And um, you know that that's a life-changing experience. That, gives you meaning. <laughs> okay. No doubt about it. <laughs> it's very different for us, maybe the younger generation who are playing games all day. And if you look at in Japan, when you have those, what do you call it, hikamoris. Yeah. And they basically never leave their house. They're just basically satisfied what they have in front of their screen. When they are totally touched, not all touched with reality. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think mythologies they are very deep and they uh, they speak another language much deeper than we are used to on this horizontal uh, civilization that that we don't get kind yeah. of reflection of ourselves. Right. Well, and you know this is this is the issue with our president who will never understand why. Um, the ruffles and flourishes that he's going to get on on Wednesday are not that meaningful to him, okay? Because he's never suffered trauma. He's never been, um, he's never actually been in life. Everybody's just let him, given him a pass. And so he's never had to learn about life and you know, I, I really uh, worry about his future, his, his psychological future. Uh, I think it's ironic that the closest he gets to nature is golf with grass yeah. and that his, his one um, entertainment <clears throat> or um, hobby, so to speak, is in something he's disconnected from. Right, right. Uh, uh, you can also uh, so, to his brother also, that he committed suicide yeah, and he got kind of just pushed out yeah. by his much stronger brother. Right. Um, and, and so he doesn't understand that there's a qualitative difference between ordering somebody to give you a 21 gun salute and having the military come forth and say, Mr. President, to honor you, we'd like to give you a 21 gun salute. There's right, you can't ask for it. There's a qualitative difference be, between the two. And <laughs> so anyway, I wanna go back to this idea of the spiritual side of life though, which, which relates to all of this uh, Eros and Logos stuff. So Logos is matter and spirit is where life is. And, and so there is a place for religions because they give us a structure in which 
we can have our spiritual life, but we can also do that without religion. Uh, religion is simply the structure, but I wanted to bring to everybody's attention, and I'm gonna wrap this thing up shortly here, um, that in this book, um, Participation in the Mystery, uh, what, and, and that's basically what we've been talking about all, all through this conversation is uh, the participation in the mystery. Um, but, and Dr. Federer, the reason I'm emphasizing this is Dr. Federer is going to be joining us on February the 7th at 1 p.m. on our Wisdom Path Colloquia. And uh, it would be great if some of, if everybody would learn something about what his positions are. Um, but he t has a section here called uh, the future of religion for scenarios. And I'm just going to Before highlight- Before you go into it, um, may I speak to Gunnar's comment to me too? Um, I appreciate you mentioning that moving away from religion and giving meaning to your life. And if I step around the semantics of that, it felt like there was a, an expression of giving you a way to root and actually have a sense of place in your life. Is that more, I mean, along the lines of, because it felt like you're trying to express a poetic concept of you belong here and gives you place. Yes, yeah. or just understanding your suffering, or, uh, or give so it. So it's name. not for not. Yes, the or suffering. Just, or uh, yeah, you could say that. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that was addressed. That was a very, very. I mean, it's also generationally, it's important because you, for example, in this group here, have the direct sense of of your age group your you know your your heritage and and where you are and that's an important voice uh, he uh, he actually had very big detachment with his father and i relate a lot to that because uh on a very early age i got attracted to art and poetry and i never got any validation from my father or my mother and mm. Uh, so I, I started to hate, started to hate my art, and I remember uh, when I was drawing like pictures when I was young, and when the younger boys would like draw over my pictures, I wouldn't really care because uh, because I on the inside I also hated my art, <laughs> and he gave me a lot of meaning uh, where this detachment from the father and the grief and to understand my father's grief. Uh, so if I would also quote uh, Carl Jung, uh, you never become conscious until you can separate yourself from the f psychology of your parents. Yeah. So uh, yes. that. Thank you. I, it felt like there was something there more to unpack that yeah. I, I appreciate you going to that level. Thank you. And I will say that from listening to you, there's uh, the problem of expectations without understanding. So in Trump's case, or in the case of many uh, young people who have extremely high expectations, but they don't have, they haven't been given the way to understand and to look. That's why these quotes, these, uh, this is so important, how you're going into trying to understand that it didn't matter that the other boys drew on top of your drawing. That's really important. And how do I start understanding the depth of that, which, which makes me have expectations which either don't fit or either above or below my sense of worth. Yeah. Yeah. And drawing on a drawing is actually quite a quite an event, because if you draw on most any four year old's drawing, you will find you found someone else to fear. I mean, that the amount of rage and godlike anger at how dare you, you know, it's the mark of self of a four year old's drawing. And I mean, I, you, I, I remember backing up going, wow, <laughs> this is a force to be reckoned with. And so I, I really hear your dispassionate where, oh, it doesn't matter. 
where you were that that far removed and i i, I appreciate the the effort yeah. and the courage um to to step back to look at that because i think it's brene brown says uh, vulnerability is the birthplace of courage and that ability to be strong enough to be gentle you just you really just shared something that was powerful yeah um, good are you uh into uh, a mental health profession what is your profession yeah mostly started for myself mental health but yeah it's i've been a very long time reader of carl jung uh-huh yeah that's he, he certainly saved me he's been my shrink through the last 35 years or so 34 years um but you're not a practicing mental health professional now <laughs> no I'm actually an electrical engineer, so. Uh -huh. okay. Oh, that's well, even better. <laughs> well, you, you might have a new calling later in life. <laughs> it's, yeah. It sounds like because. Uh, I've actually been uh, losing touch with electrical engineering or it, did, it doesn't give me kind of sense of life anymore. Or, uh, so I've been also looking in other directions. Uh -huh. So that's, uh, that's the point. I, I very often have thought about going for professional training but then i decided that it wasn't what i wanted to do with my life and it seems i've found a niche now <laughs> such as it is um all right i, I just want to read uh, uh ferrer's four uh scenarios for the future of religion and um I'll just leave it at a very outline basis, which is the headlines for the four scenarios. And then we can come back to this next week because this is a, a very heavy section, but. Yeah, it'd be a good good place to lead in and segue to start All next right. week with. All right, so, so the four scenarios for the future of religion now, uh, and given that current religions aren't uh, fulfilling the spiritual needs of people. Uh, one is a global religion. Um, a second one is mutual transformation of religions. And this relates to the participation aspect. And then um, interspiritual wisdom. And finally, spirituality without religion. And obviously, um, we can have spirituality and without religion. I mean, we've talked uh, in the Tarot group about the fifth Tarot and, and the idea of, of uh, this fifth suit in Tarot, uh, which ends up being a, a bit airy fairy from my point of view because it it just talks about all these different approaches to spirituality without without putting enough logos on it so that i can understand what the hell they're <laughs> what well, they see, that's the irony of your perspective i love that because you can you'll cop on logos all day long but then then i, I, I want to just I, distinguishing it Right, because I guess I think that's it right there. You distinguish it rather than extinguish it, because so. otherwise it's chaos, right? Right, and your red ball is exactly. Right. Oh, oh, that's there's your Ouroboros. Yeah. So, uh, like otherwise it. it's chaos, <laughs> and um, and that's that's the way their fifth suit comes comes out to me. It's chaotic, <laughs> and uh, so. Spirituality without religion is certainly possible. My, my wife and I used to go to a yin yoga class. And uh, although there was no specific religion involved in it, um, I realized that the yoga teachers were actually um, teaching uh, Hinduism, uh, in Hindu approaches to things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, there are yoga teachers in Nebraska, you know, that, they, you know, uh, and so, uh, and so with the point is that there, there 
uh, spiritual teachers without really knowing it um, almost. And, and they're, you know, they're taught to go through the motions and yet I don't think they really know that they're actually uh, following a, a religious path. But what's interesting to me about discipline of the ritual is that any path to mastery of anything brings you to self. I mean, it's, it's that it's the same way it works even with military. I mean, the marching and the songs, what happens is you line out the bars to then play the music onto. And those pieces to me are never the music, even my architecture for, you know, in my tarot and astrology, it's, it's the discipline of the ritual. And then I pour the music in between. But I think a lot of people get lost in the logos of I need to do 18 reps of four. And that's not discipline. That's just rote memory and compulsion. Right. And um, yeah. And Vanessa a, chimed in as well on the, on the yin yoga. Right. Um, and as far as the, the military is concerned, um, you know, the, the president can come to, um, to 8th and I, which is the headquarters barracks of the Marine Corps in Washington and, and have a evening parade done in his honor. Uh, but if he orders it, that's not, he doesn't understand the meaning. Yeah, it's if, not a restaurant. There's no menu. You don't get to choose. Right. People t people give you that honor and unsolicited. Yeah. And uh, I remember I, I've been to that parade probably 10 times in my life at least. And um, when one time I went and the honoree was uh, Martha Ray <clears throat> and <clears throat> Martha Ray was um, was an entertainer who uh, did USO uh, shows during World War II and was uh, and obviously she was very meaningful to the troops during the war and you know I remember um, being at, at one of those. A performance is not of Martha Ray, but of Bob Hope in Vietnam, and it was quite meaningful because it reconnected you back with the world, mm -hmm. which, which is what we called everything outside of the Vietnam War is the world, right? And uh, and I was I actually was not even going to be permitted to go to see the Bob Hope show, but I managed to get myself sick <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right before. And, and so I, I went to the Bob Hope show wearing pajamas here, you know, hospital, hospital garb, blue, blue uh, hospital outfit. Um, and, uh, and it was quite meaningful to me. Now, let's see, Miles says something. The four scenarios are actually going to be the stages of a progression. Yes, maybe so. Um, and so we can talk to with Dr. Ferreira more on the 7th of Feb, but anyway, we'll try to talk about them next week. And that Excellent. at least gives us direction for the coming week. And uh, I'm going to all this to thanks it. Juan and Vanessa yeah. and Gunnar thanks for yeah. being here yeah Thank you. and uh, do you have anything you want to wrap up with Gunnar before or Vanessa before we close out um, no I'm just currently reading this book uh, The Great Model by uh, uh, by Neumann it's a very Derek heavy. Neumann yeah that's yeah. a great one Maybe I can. You might, you might look at Eric Neumann's "The Place of Creation" too when you finish that one. It's I really, really resonated with it. Yeah. Um, okay. I just, I just wrote, uh, Gunnar, that um, my career has been as an art teacher, uh -huh. and as I started very early in my twenties teaching in the public schools, I realized very quickly that I was holding sacred space for the children 
where the misunderstanding of creativity or the lack of understanding of creativity in the general curriculum and in the general American uh, public education was critical. And then in Switzerland, I've told retired people for 25 years, and a lot of it has to do with restorative healing for all the damage of the early years in their creative expression of people. And it's quite severe, usually taking maybe three years before that calms down to mm -hmm. enjoy the creation. Boy, that's so important, Vanessa. And I, I don't know how we have to, maybe we can give you some moments next week to talk to us about how we get the importance of art back into, uh, into our education. And I appreciate just the way you put that, Vanessa, because every, in Texas, for example, I remember with H. Ross Perot and the essential elements and all this logos, logos stuff, reason, reason, reason. The argument when someone would say, well, why really should we have art in the schools? You can't make money at that stuff. So there was just that argument that always would kind of put it down, cut it off at the knees. But when you pull up the holding sacred space for basically the mode of being that everyone has the opportunity and I find right to access and be made aware of to have the choice to um, engage in that and that restorative healing. Um, and Frederick Douglass, you know, it's much easier to raise strong children than to repair broken adults. Um, and that your, your work there speaks to that. I, I definitely, Skip, I'm glad you'd like to um, put some time there because I feel like you may have a perspective on how we can come together to enact that because we have to get yeah. past the superficial arguments of, oh, well, you can't make money. Well, you can, but that's not the point. And so I think you're, you're nodding at a, a mode of being that's natural and necessary. Yeah. yeah, it's it's the joy of life. Right, the joy of life, right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I see in my own father's life, um, he was, um, well, I'll have to see if I can find this, but um, he was, my, my dad was, pretty sad most of his life in, in many ways. Um, I mean, he was a, a good father, a good provider, but um, he had more joy in his life when I was like four years old. And he, he painted a portrait though of Emmett Kelly uh, when, when I was four. And, you know, I was very excited about this portrait and then it comes into fruition and it's this sad clown. And, uh, and I look back on that and I say, oh my God, how, how sad was my father at that time? And I think that was the last thing that he ever painted. He, did, he had done some artwork in his youth, but he, he got away from it entirely. Um, became an accountant and a supply officer in the Navy. And, and uh, that was the end of it. Um, and so. Well, Skip, um, just to round out what I have to say is thank you for showing your self-portrait. And I think the glint in the eye is what we're after. Yep. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're you're quite welcome, and at least I recognized it, right? <laughs> yeah, before that, the sacred ember goes out, you 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 blow a little air and pop that fire back okay. up, right? So anyway, okay, peace, everyone. I we're gonna move on, and uh, I don't have anything scheduled between now, uh, anything special scheduled between now and uh, the seventh of February, but. I might get something. It depends on whether time permits. I, I don't know if anybody else feels it, but my wife and I, who are both extremely intuitive, um, are feeling huge collective pressure on mm -hmm. ourselves. And, uh, 
and it do, it doesn't mean we're feeling it by people calling us or that sort of thing, but it's just exhausting being in this time uh, with with what's going on in our current affairs, and you know the the outcome of it is obvious, <laughs> but but how how much pain will be necessary and how much blood will be necessary before the outcome comes is well and i i feel that too i if i if for example i went to my massage therapist she goes oh there you go doing it again playing the century always at half ready but there's a there's a light flex i've been feeling that basically focuses me to be more aware of my external environment um of things are coming i don't know what they are i'm not I kind of have an anti-hysterical bias. Uh, I'm not going to kind of try to make it negative or say, oh, God, the world's going to end. Because then my grandmother would come back and go, you know, there are only two days you can't do anything about anything, yesterday and tomorrow. So right now, what are you going to (laughs) do? Yeah, that's the the thing. And uh, so... So anyway, we we are going on with the Tarot sessions on Monday nights and the advanced reading group on Wednesdays. And uh, if I come up with something else, I'll, and we'll be doing this on Sunday mornings. Um, I'm thinking about uh, doing some sort of open Q&A sessions. Um, but... <sighs> I have to figure out what the format of that would be. Um, I, I think that's that. That would be a nice. Um, I think that would be wonderful, just as an experience, but also as research too. To mine, m i n e, the collective, as to perspectives that are valuable and effective to put to good logos use, so to speak. Yeah. Well, we'll think about that some more. Uh, but no death by chair for you. That's <laughs> yeah. I got to get moving again. That's for sure. Um, I'm using a cane these days because my hip is gone. So <laughs> just trying to get through COVID so I can have my surgery. Right, so anyway, right. peace. Take care, right. everybody. <laughs>